yes, it's about finding fulfillment and following your passions and, and making those decisions, but ultimately your lives are some of your relationships. If you're a creative person, if you're a baker, a dancer, a photographer, a screenwriter, an actor, a comedian, a podcaster, and you want to figure out how to make a living doing what you love, this is the show. This is the show. Don't keep your day job. My name is Kathy Heller, and I'm a singer-songwriter. I make a living doing what I love, and I want that for you. This is the show that's going to help you do that and give you not only inspiration, but some real life strategies. This is going to help you figure out how to take your creative passion and turn it into a profit. This episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job is brought to you by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash dreamjob. You will love how good it tastes and you're going to love how great it feels to create incredible home-cooked meals from blueapron.com slash dreamjob. Hey guys, this is Kathy Heller. Welcome back to another episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job. So I have this idea and I just want to put it out there. One of the things that I love when I hear from you, I've been getting so many awesome emails and people telling me what they want to do. I keep asking you to send me photos. When someone tells me that they are an artist, I'm like, send me photos of your art. When someone tells me that they have a clothing line, I'm like, send me photos. When someone tells me that they love to do a particular thing, I'm like, I want to see it. And I don't know what's going to come out of this yet, but I want to just go with my gut. One of the things that I always tell you is that I want you to start because you're going to figure things out as you go. And when you hesitate and you try to have all the answers, that's just going to make everything really hard and it's not really going to help you. So I have this idea. I really want to see what you're up to. I started this show because I believe that every person is so unique and special and I want to see people happy and fulfilled and thriving and feeling expressed and I want to challenge you to start doing it and this whole show is here to empower you and inspire you and give you ideas but I know that it's really hard to get out of our head and actually get in the game so what if I asked you to start sending me stuff I want to see what it is I want to see what you're working on so can you send me Um, an example of your writing, if you're a writer, can you send me a photo of the the t-shirts that you make? Can you share it with me? Whatever it is that you're doing, share it with me. And I have this hunch that something really cool is going to come out of this. I'm going to figure out something to do with all of this, but I want to look through it and I want to absorb it. And at the very least, I want to support and be here for you to keep you inspired and accountable. So here's what I want you to do. Go to nodayjobs.com and I want you to sign up there. I'm going to send you back instructions of how to send me this thing. And I think what I'm going to then do is pick a few things that I'm really excited about that get sent to me. And I want to talk about it and I want to share them with all of our listeners. So I'm excited to see all the delicious, lovely, amazing things that you guys are working on. And I want to be here to support you. So go to nodayjobs.com. You're going to sign up and then you and I will have this email connection. And then I'm going to email you back and tell you how to send this to me and this way that I'll I'll know how to see it because I get thousands and thousands of emails. So I want to be able to give you like some specific feedback. And so this way I can flag those emails and know that they're coming from you. So I'm so excited because I really want to see what it is that you guys do and what you're up to. Um, The other thing is just recently, um, the people that are on my mailing list, I send you guys updates. So every week I'm sending you any tip or advice or idea or inspiration. I've been putting together cheat sheets and I've also been letting you guys in on just my personal life. And recently I told everybody on my mailing list something that if you're on my mailing list, you know what it is. And in the course of telling people this specific personal thing, and if you get on my mailing list, you'll find out more about my personal stuff that I've been sharing with the mailing list. But um, people started sending me photos of their town. People started sending me photos of their corner of the world and where they live. And I love it. Essentially, like this whole show isn't a platform for me. This is a platform for you. This is all about you. I want to help you have a mirror to see how incredible you are. I want you to be happy. There's an amazing quote by Howard Thurman. And he says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And that's exactly why I started the show. I want you to be the happiest version of you. I want you to walk through your day with a skip in your step because you're on your way to do what it is that you do and do what it is that you love and express what it is that you here 
are here to express. We are here to make the most of the time that we have. And the best way to do that is for you to be happy. Because when you're happy, it's like a light switch that turns on and there's a glow behind your eyes. And you then are in that state and that state of mind and that physical state, everything that that does to who you are, it allows everybody around you to get to know you and see the best of you. And I want you to keep putting one foot in front of the other. So I am here to challenge you to not only do I want you to be thinking every single day, what's one thing that you can be doing, but I want you to send it to me. I want you to send it to me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look through all these submissions and then I'm going to pick a few of these that really speak to me and I will let you know what I'm going to do with this. But I'm excited and I just feel like everything I've ever done is just like, this is another example of like, you just take one step and you'll see what happens. Starting this podcast was like that. I didn't know step number eight. I just knew step number one. And that's the other thing is like, I just want you to go and do the very next thing. Every single day, you'll know what next thing you need to do. It's going to be clear. If you're in the habit of taking one step forward every single day, Each day, if you really keep yourself accountable to do something, you'll know which thing to do. It'll just be clear. So I hope that all the guests on our show continue to inspire you. Today, we have someone awesome. I have been a fan of her work for so long. Emily Giffen is here. She is a best-selling author. She wrote Something Borrowed, Something Blue. Her new book comes out in paperback today, and I'm so happy that she's here. By the way, her publisher was nice enough to send me four copies. So one of them is mine, but I have an additional three copies. And if you go to nodayjobs.com and you get on my mailing list, I'm going to pick three people and I'm going to send you a lovely little package with um, one of these three extra books that I have. And I'm sure you're going to love it because Emily is the best, one of my favorite authors. When I get her books, I cannot put them down. They're like candy. They're so much fun and they're there's just so much fun to read. It's 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 like a girlfriend you've always known your whole life is talking to you. Um, so one of the other reasons I wanted to have Emily on the show is not only because I love her books, but because Emily is one of us. Emily was a lawyer. She went to UVA Law School and she had a job in Manhattan and she left to go do something she really wanted to do. She took that risk. So I can't wait to dive in now, Emily, and hear your whole story. I also wanted to tell you that you can do something that really helps us and You know how sometimes you feel like by doing something, you're not going to make such a difference, so why bother? If you go and leave us a review on iTunes, it really, really helps our show. Every time someone leaves a review, our show gets more and more exposure, which means that I can help more and more people to be reminded that they are unique and they need to get busy doing what it is that they were put in this world to do. So... I would love if each one of you would go and leave us an iTunes review. Some of you already have, and I so appreciate it. So take a a second and leave us an iTunes review. It means so much to me, and I really appreciate it. And to say thank you for posting iTunes reviews, I am going to do something special. So if you send me an email, and the subject line is delicious review, and inside the email, you send me a screenshot of the iTunes review that you left, I also want you to include your snail mail address, because anyone who sends me a screenshot of the iTunes review that you are going to leave and the subject line delicious review um, and your mailing address I'm going to send you a lovely little package to say thank you something that I love that I picked out of one of my favorite stores I'm going to send you a package that I'm going to put together and send you a couple items that I love that I think will make you smile so thank you so much for leaving reviews please tell your friends about our show it really helps spread the word if you like the episode tag it post it um, spread the word it makes us so happy and if you tag me on on Twitter, I'll see it and I'll just feel that much more supported. So thank you so much. And go to nodayjobs.com and sign up to be part of this adventure and you will be part of this like insiders group. And there's special stuff that I only share there. And I also share cheat sheets every week and tips and advice. And I'll let you know when the next pop-up group is going to be. I've been doing these pop-up video sessions and meeting with people online. And I continue to do it because I really enjoy it. And I just did one two days ago. And I loved getting to meet all these people. And I always feel the same way. There's, You know, you turn on the computer and you open up your screen and you're looking at faces of people you've never met. And there's just like an immediate connection. And all of a sudden, once again, you're just reminded that there's such kindness and goodness and everybody deserves to be doing what it is that they love to do. So I hope that each of the guests on this show continue to remind you that if you put one foot in front of the other, things are going to come. And when you, what's that Rumi quote I posted on Instagram? What you seek is seeking you. 
So go for it and go toward it. And you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to have it all figured out. And I know it's scary. We're all afraid of failing, but it's amazing what's going to happen when you take that heart and you have that pure intention and you show up and you start to contribute and put things out in the world. So the first place you can start to put that out um, is send it to me. So I want you to go to nodayjobs.com. And I want you to um, sign up and I'm going to tell you special instructions. I want you guys to be sending that stuff to me and I want to look through it and I'll start to share um, what I'm going to do with that next. The other thing you can do to support our show is to support our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, it's so win-win. So this episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job is brought to you by Blue Apron. You can check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash dream job. You're going to love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals from blueapron.com slash dream job. You know, not all ingredients are equal and we know that as moms, I've got three little girls and I want to make sure that the food is fresh and high quality. So Blue Apron knows that and they're going to give you a great experience. They're going to send you stuff. It's not pre-cooked, right? So every week we open the box and it's interesting stuff. It might be Thai dishes. It might be Mexican food. It's always stuff with different flavors and it's all packed on dry ice. So none of it has preservative. It's like fresh lime, fresh fish, fresh whatever it is. And they're very conscientious about not wasting wasting, which I love. So they pre-proportion everything out. So you're not going to have waste, which I think is really nice. You can customize your recipes too. Every week you can customize your recipes based on your preferences. Blue Apron has several delivery options also, and there's no weekly commitment. You only get deliveries when you want them. Thanks again to Blue Apron for supporting this podcast. You can check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping. Just go to blueapron.com slash dream job. Thank you, Blue Apron. Thanks for supporting our podcast. And we love this community and we want to keep making this show and keep giving you as much support as we can. If you want to give back to us, the best thing that you can do is leave us an iTunes review and then support our sponsors. You're going to get free stuff that we believe in. We're choosing sponsors who we feel are, you know, who we really believe in. And so we're going to bring you free, awesome stuff that you can try and you're going to get stuff for free and you'll be supporting our show in the meantime. So now we're going to dive in to this awesome interview with Emily. Emily has written eight books. Her newest one, like I said, comes out today in paperback. One of her books was turned into a movie, Something Borrowed. Kate Hudson starred in it. And it's just so awesome that you agreed to be here. You're somebody that I've admired for so long. I love your books. And like I said, you left your day job. So it's like perfect. There's like such serendipity. So thank you for being here. So let's start with you. As a kid, were you drawn to books and writing and Let's talk sure. about that. Yes, definitely. My mother is a retired librarian, so books were such an early part of my life. I have one sister, she's a year older, and the two of us, we read all the time, you know, as soon as we could read. You know, we went to the library before we could read, she would read to us picture books, and then and we moved around a lot, too. My dad was an executive with Sears, so we moved every few years and was constantly making, having to make new friends, so books really were so important to me. When I was little, mm-hmm. like, you know, a step past the picture books, um, you know, with the first sort of chapter books I read were all the Beverly Cleary, you know, the Ramona books and oh, the yeah. um, Betsy yeah. Chasey and Tib, which I don't, the Maud Hart Lovelace, I don't know that kids are reading them as much, but the Little House on the Prairie, you know, a lot of the series, yeah. but they just were, you know, they were my friends. And um, very quickly after I started to read, you know, I, I would write my own stories. And I remember in the first grade, they asked us what we wanted to be, you know, that it was sort of a school question that the teachers were asking. We all had to fill out what we wanted to be when we were, and when we grew grew up. And I I remember in the first grade, I said I wanted to be an author. So it was something that's just always, I I never stopped saying that, even even later in life when I was in high school and college and making those decisions in the back of my head, it was something that I wanted to do. And it was always a part of my life. I mean, it changed forms along the way. Like, I mean, in um, high school, I was the I was in the creative writing club, but I was also like editor in chief of the newspaper, and you know, I kept a journal. But it was always in some form or another um, writing and thinking about that possibility to to be a writer and how I could do that. I know from reading your bio that you wound up going to great schools and even UVA Law School, which is one of the best of the best, if not the best, sometimes. Um, so, what happened in high school that made you then decide? in undergrad to pursue sure. something else? Or were you pursuing writing in undergrad? You know, so, you know, I, I, I did consider the journalism angle for a short time, particularly sports, you know, sports writing, which one of my eight novels is sort of about sports. But for the most part, you know, I 
changed my focus along the way to just more back to fiction. But um, I think what happened is when I got to college, I majored in history and English, and I still was sort of thinking along the lines of writing. Um, but when I decided that I wanted to write fiction, and that's really what I loved more than, you know, journalism, again, I think it's the whole introverted thing and just my love of, you know, novels. But um, I thought to myself, okay, you really, you don't graduate from college and just start writing, you know, novels, like you need a job, like I needed, to, I needed a, a real job. And I think law right. school for many is the path that is chosen when you're, you know, you're type A and you have this, you know, great transcript, you know, I had a straight A's in college and I thought, okay, I can get into law school, like take the LSAT and get, get into law school. And it's sort of, I feel yeah. sometimes, you know, there are certainly people who really want to go into the law and, um, you know, whether to be a DA or work at a large firm or whatever, but I think a lot of people choose it as, as a default. And it was definitely yeah. the case for me, but i took the LSAT. I, you know, I did well. I applied to schools and lo and behold, <laughs> I was an attorney. It was time to take the bar. It was time to pay back all the loans. And um, in the back of my head, though, I, I never stopped wanting to write. I never stopped writing. You know, I wrote, I, I continued to keep a journal. I continued to write stories. Yeah. And I think there are certain pitfalls that come with type A people who they're trying to achieve something that they perceive as worthy of achieving like you know sort of like oh I can get into a good law school then I certainly should because everybody around me appreciates and values that particular accomplishment wow that's really and so I think that and I remember too I had the dean of the UVA law school on the very first day we sat down and I wasn't in that mindset then of oh, I'm someday not going to be a lawyer and I'm someday going to, I wasn't thinking about writing at that particular time. I was excited about, you know, studying law, but I was in this auditorium and he gave this speech about, you have to be cautious of, you know, this, this, this same pitfall that I'm talking about of like trying to achieve for the sake of achievement and climbing the, you know, the, the ladder and every rung that sort of um, gets you farther away from the thing it is that you want to do. And I think really what he was saying yeah, is, you know, this is a law school where if you follow that path, you will get these top law firm jobs and you will make a lot of money and everyone around right. you will be impressed and, and you will be a success by any sort of objective measure. But I think what he was asking right. us all to do is to think about other paths that we could use our law degree for, which which in retrospect is is pretty amazing thing for the dean of a law school to do. It's amazing. But- no, I would not picture that at all. And that's like, he's so tuned in. And he's basically saying to you, like, how are you going to be fulfilled? Like, not just right. be successful, but be successful and right. fulfilled. So did that, did that have you thinking about other things? Or you were just sort of letting that wash over you and then continuing you know, to work not on at the time. I thought it was almost curious um, that he would that he would spend so much time sort of almost telling us to to, to not, you know, want to be corporate <laughs> lawyers or, you know, or or sort of, you know, the big firm lawyers. But I think, you know, in short order, I realized as the friends that I made who were maybe a class ahead of us, they would get these like, you know, uh, these great summer associate positions and they would come back and say, oh, it's like, it's brutal and people seem miserable at these firms. So I understood that, you know, and he probably had those discussions with a lot of, you know, young lawyers and everyone knows that that's sort of the culture of this. Right. So what happened when you graduated? Where did you wind up going? Right. So went to a again, firm? I fell right into the pitfalls of that, I think, which turned out to be a good thing because I think that for me, going into a large law firm, misery was so motivating that's ultimately what led me to writing. And I often wonder that's if I right. had been awesome. you know, a yeah. DA, I think I really would have loved that work and probably would never have quit to write a novel, which is what I think I would love more than being a DA. But in any event, I did well enough, not as well as I did in undergrad, but well enough to get one of those jobs in the economy that we were in at the time and um, moved to Manhattan. And I had a standard, well, standard at the time, I'm sure it's a lot more now, but it was, you know, like $98,000 worth of loans. And um, so I started the practice of law and did not like it nearly as well as as studying law, the the intellectual academic side. And so I sort of devised a plan right away to, you know, pay back the loans and, and pursue what I really loved. 
So how long were you in It was firm? five years. Um, it took me about wow, four a and a half to pay them back. And I had a nice salary, but I told myself to live like, you know, you're a first grade school teacher salary and then just pay them back sooner. And so I definitely, you know, did that and was able to pay them back. And, and while I practiced, I, um, I wrote a book. It was a lot of grunt work at that level. And I think that's what makes people so miserable. It's not just the, the sheer, you know, magnitude of the, the work and the hours, but it's also just the sort of mindlessness of it. And the fact that you think that you're going to, you know, you, I watched LA law, you're too young for that probably, sure. but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know yeah, what that I watched is. That yeah, yeah. I'm like, where's the exciting work? And there wasn't, you know, it wasn't happening. So I would lose myself in this fiction and I finished a book. It took me about four years to write it. It was a young adult novel and, you know, I was able to get an agent, which, you know, you read all these, well, as you know, you've been through that with, and you're not writing fiction, but, um, you've been through this right. with your agent, but you, you do, you find an agent and you feel like, well, she found you. So that's really not quite the same. So you, you had, you, you're the one of the really lucky ones that are pursued by an agent. <laughs> so, so I wrote, wrote the book and I found it and I got an agent. But while you're at the firm, you got Correct. the agent? So I was... So I sent okay. it around and, you know, I got the standard rejection slips. And then finally I had an agent that wanted to represent me. And I was thrilled because you really feel, you know, you're told you read this in the books that, that, that right. that's a big step. That's sort of you're halfway, you're, you know, you're at least halfway there when you get an agent or uh-huh. I don't know, you're a third of the way there, but you're definitely feeling yeah. hopeful. So I was thrilled and she, um, she shopped the book around and the, the rejection letters, you know, rolled in slowly at first, or actually probably quickly at first, but there was a few outstanding letters. And then I got depressed. And then it was like, this is never going to happen. And I remember this agent that I had, she, I think she signed a lot of clients up looking back. I think that's what it was. And so she didn't really have any great faith in this book. And looking back, I can also see that it that it wasn't very commercially viable or it wasn't very well written or whatever it was. I mean, it was a decent book. I'm mm-hmm. proud of it as a first step. But ultimately, um, it was rejected. But I couldn't get her to even email me back to like tell me that it was like not going to happen. So I remember I finally wrote her this letter and it was like, happy new year. You know, I understand there's probably not great news, but I really wanted closure with this manuscript. And she wrote back and everyone has stories like this, you know, their stories of just sinking so low and like, oh, this is there. But yeah. she wrote this email back that said they all rejected it. And that was it. And she didn't even write a period at the end of the sentence. It's <laughs> like, I'm yeah. not worth like. Don't you love at this moment being able to tell this story, though? Yeah. Because this says, it, first of all, it's amazing because we all know what happened. But it also says so much about you that you lived through that moment and you wound up here. So what's the next thing that you know, happened? There, definitely there's some grit involved here and, you know, persistence. And, you know, I, I have to give myself some credit. But not, not as much as you're giving me or not as much as people give me. Because remember, the, the, the <laughs> other option was returning to this career that I just, like, hated. You know, like, I hated it. And I think that returns to this idea of sometimes it's better to be thoroughly miserable than it is to be just comfortable because, you know, I think the really yes. brave people, and I'm sure you've interviewed many of these are the ones that are, were, were comfortable and were happy, but it wasn't, they weren't happy enough. And, you know, they, those are the people that really are risking a lot. Um, and, and, you know, you characterize it so nicely in the beginning when you said, you know, you had a successful career. Well, you know, not really. I mean, I had a, career that was well respected and well paid, but I was very junior and I was very miserable. So the alternative, you know, I had two choices at that point, just sort of give up on the whole notion of writing based on, you know, this bad experience with this agent and these rejection letters from, you know, all the publishing houses in New York, (laughs) or I could, um, (laughs) you know, I could try, try again um, and write another book. So, So, you know, obviously I wrote another book. I tried again. Well, you're still at the firm. You're writing another so book. So I knew back. that it had taken me, you know, four plus years to write this manuscript and to go through the process. And, you know, I had some other ideas of what I wanted to write about, but I knew that it was going and I was becoming, you know, more, slightly more senior, like more senior associate. So the workload was greater and the commitment would have to be, you know, greater too. I wasn't on as many like mindless document reviews. And so I knew realistically right. that it would take at least another four or five years 
it was hard to make that change, but I ultimately I decided I was going to give myself a, you know, one year deadline. So the self-imposed one year deadline to try again, to write another book. And that was also something that I had one very risk averse parent who was extremely practical and, you know, was looking at what I had accomplished to that point in graduating from a top law school and getting a, you know, a good job and, right. you know, getting good reviews and all of that. That was my father. And he was understandably just, <laughs> just worried about we're coming into a recession and what if you can't get another job and you've worked so hard. And, and then my mother who just, I think understood on a different level, not that she was any more supportive than my than my father, but I think she understood because she shares it, the love of, you know, reading and writing and this passion for, for writing. And she sort of understood it more fully. And I think she's a little bit more this personality type, like, okay, try it. You know, the worst that could happen is it doesn't work out. You have to come back. Um, And I think that's the one thing I'm sure you hear again and again. The thing that I tell people is, I think people magnify their risks in their mind. And and one of them is that you're broke, you can't get a job or whatever. But I think one of the big ones is that you'll fail, you know, that you'll fail, that you'll have to tell people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's it's embarrassing. And you're putting yourself on the line in the same way when you pursue a relationship and you know, you know, you might get rejected. I mean, there's, there's vulnerability in going after what you want in a way that there's not when you're sort of in a lukewarm relationship or a lukewarm career. And you're like, I don't care. So true. So I think that's part of it. But I do remember there was a partner who I worked for. His name was Bob. His first name was Bob, but he, he was just brutal. He was really tough to work for and not particularly nice. And um, we were all somewhat afraid of him and, he didn't seem very happy being a lawyer either. But the, the yeah, day that I left my law firm, I mean, I'd left sort of in stages, you know, like I worked a little less, a little less, a little less. But the last day that I really left with my final box of, you know, personal items from my office, I was standing in the 42nd floor of the MetLife building in New York and the elevator doors opened and I got in and he was sort of, he was coming out or he was waiting, but he passed me by and he said, oh, you're going to write that second novel because I guess he knew that the first one didn't pan out for me. And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I am. And he did that sort of the double gun shot hand signal. Can you picture that? And yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. he's like, good luck with that. And I remember thinking, man, like he had this little smirk on his face. He's totally a character oh, from a movie. Just, That's hysterical. And I oh remember God. thinking, so I do not want him to know when this book is ultimately rejected. And I actually remember thinking, okay, it probably won't happen for me, but he's not going to keep track of me by then. He'll have moved on to his next prey, like associate prey. And I don't have to come back to this oh. firm with my tail between my legs and announce that I didn't yep. publish the book. I could go to a different city or a different firm. So I, yeah. I was still yeah. thinking in those terms of, how to protect myself from this this feeling of, you know, ultimately failing and being embarrassed. And that's one thing that I, I do think is sort of universal to this whole pursue your passion thing. You just have to take you have to take a certain risk. Yeah. So what happened? So where did you go write it? I know you went to London at some point. Was that this or you I went did. there I went later? to London. Um, I had, you know, my mother's a huge Anglophile too. You can tell the number of times I've mentioned her in this. She's quite an influence in my life. But my sister had lived in England. She moved to London and she had one of those work study jobs at Harrods. So she had done this. And, you know, I always joke that if I had been truly brave, I would have moved to Italy and written Eat, Pray, Love. (laughs) Or, but you know, of course, it's the same language. And I thought this is an adventure, but it still felt safe enough. And, you know, I had you know enough money saved where I was just going to try to write this book and see what happened. And so did you live with your sister or you? No, you got, got my own place. place. She was back by then. And, you know, I wrote the book and my then boyfriend at the time ended up moving to to London, too. He's, he's now my husband and we have three children. Um, and so oh, he was, you know, so he was cool. with me and because it took me longer than I wanted to write it. But it was a sort of a self-imposed one year deadline. And I did write it in 14 months. So I was. I was proud of that. I just treated it like a like my you know full time job. Um, I did have a I had, were you I had a side job at a printing press while I was there. Okay, got it. 
So, so you're in London, and what happened next? So the first agent that I reached out to, of course, you know, I was completely disillusioned with the one that didn't think I was worthy of the period at the end of the rejection statement. So I needed to find <laughs> a new agent. And it's also, let's be honest, it's also always sort of helpful to not take the full responsibility for your failure to say like, oh, well, if this happened or that happened. So in the back of my mind, I was like, well, maybe I just needed a better agent. So um, when when I was leaving New York, I ended up leaving you know, my flight was scheduled for September 16th, 2001. So it was the week of 9-11. And it was actually the first, I believe this is, it was definitely the first day, but I think it was like the first international flight they let out, which was, you know, from New York to to Heathrow, JFK to Heathrow. And so I was on, you know, it was on that plane. So my going away party was actually, which really has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I just think it's interesting timing. But my like little party was a weekend before 9-11. And at that party, there was, the woman there who wasn't a friend of mine, she was, she was dating someone who was a friend of mine and um, she was an agent and she's very nice. And we connected, we had a a great conversation about, you know, books and what she did for a living and what I was trying to do and my former agent and her thoughts about that and just everything about the industry. And so she gave me her number and I was, I just really liked her, which I think is important to connect with an agent when you can, when you have the opportunity to like have that connection because you know that then they believe in you that much more. Yeah. But we had this great, you know, conversation and I kept in touch with her over the 14 months and she was the first person I sent the manuscript to. And she read it quickly and she wrote back right away. And in my mind, that was how I pictured it unfolding. She's going to represent it. And she was the person I just kind of pictured as I wrote this book, but she was going to represent it and we would, you know, she would find a home for it. And this was, this was my hope, you know, that you're 50% of you that believes in yourself hope. And so I sent her the manuscript and she read it quickly and she wrote back that she, that she really liked it. And she thought, you know, it was a great book and it had a lot of promise and, she wanted me to revise it in rather significant ways. And she, you know, one of her, for, for those who have read Something Borrowed or seen the movie, you know, it's a girl who falls in love with her best friend's fiance. And it's it takes place yeah. over the course of really one summer. So it's written from, you know, right before Memorial Day to to Labor Day when the wedding is scheduled for, you know, this early September mm-hmm. wedding. So it happens in this short span of time. And her feeling about it, which is a response that I get from some readers, is Rachel's sort of like a loser. I mean, she's so focused on this one guy. I mean, loser's a little harsh to say, but like certainly not a feminist, not very strong, so all consumed with this one relationship. And yes, she understood that she hated her job as a lawyer. So that I had a lot to draw from there, but she should have had more going for her. And I remember (laughs) writing back and like, well, do you think she should be training for a marathon or like maybe building houses for Habitat for Humanity or just like, you know, uh, like, what yeah. were you thinking? She's like, I don't know. Maybe make the timeline longer. Maybe make the, she just needs to have more going for her in her life, which the fact that the book was published and sold without making those changes doesn't make her wrong and me right. But ultimately I thought to myself, the whole dilemma here with this character is that she was all consumed with this relationship and yeah. was the sense yeah. of this ticking clock and like she had to make a decision and this affair was sort of one summer and it was intense and if she had loved her job or she had been training for a marathon or she had been I think it would have diluted it would have trivialized what she was doing and it would have made it like yeah and it makes so much sense because so many people are like that they get so caught up in their job they don't have any time for themselves and then this one person comes along and that becomes what rescues them from all this misery like it makes so much sense and I think frankly she was right it was sort of a a, a, like lame thing to do but that was part of why she was doing it yeah it makes total sense yep so my um, then boyfriend said to me I remember he said to me you know he read it and I said I don't think I'm going to make these changes and he said and he hates when I tell this story because because he's so he's so supportive and he usually is right but he said oh just play ball with her and make the changes like just throw in some hobbies or make the changes and I'm like no I really I don't believe that this is you know the right answer I didn't Mm -hmm. believe in the changes and that's also what I tell people don't be stubbornly prideful and don't be afraid of the work but make sure you believe in the changes or you're at least willing to be open to them and I really wasn't open to her suggestions so that was mm-hmm. tough too, because I felt like that was my great lead. That was the only agent I knew. That was the only agent I had ever met. Yeah. And um, to say yeah. to her, "Thank you so much," and you know, maybe maybe I'll be in touch <laughs> again. But I, I don't, 
I don't right. think that's what I want to do with this character. Yeah, that takes was tough. charge. And yeah. so I sent it out to, I just got, I remember it was, I got the book called Jeff Herman's Guide to Agents. I'm sure it's still out there in a new edition. So what happened? You reached out to a bunch of people? Uh, just a few. So I wrote maybe, um, like found five I like, and I sent two or three letters out right away. I think the advice is you're supposed to just do one at a time, but I definitely didn't do that. I did like two or three and um, okay. one of them that I really liked, her name is um, Stephanie Evans, and uh, she wrote back right away, and she you know, wanted to represent me, and I really liked her, and she was so excited with what I had written. I guess she read a partial, yeah. I think, you know, I had sent maybe her three chapters or whatever it is she had requested, and she called me, and it was right before Thanksgiving, of course, here in the States, but it was, it was not you know, in, in London. And so it was sort of a more regular work week for me. And, and she said, I'm going to read it over Thanksgiving. I'll, you know, send it to me right away. And I did. And she read it right away and she called back and she wanted to represent it. And I was, I was thrilled. And I think that that's another sort of sub piece of advice that I give to, to writers is, you know, just look for that excitement, you know, whether it's your, whether it's your partner yes. and writing something or whether it's your agent or, you know, like a writing partner is, is what I meant. Like if you're writing yeah. a script or something, just look for someone that sort of shares yeah. that, that spark, who gets it. And so she did yeah. and, and she sent it out and we had really good news in pretty short order. And it was very different than the first time around. So I'd like to say that that was wow. the happiest so- day of my life when she called. And I feel terrible when I say that because I'm, 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 I'm married with, with three children, <laughs> right? And two <laughs> twins and one so right. that's two days that I had babies born and and a marriage but um you know when you're married you get married you're so stressed and there's so much that you're you're consumed with things that don't matter and in, in part and when you have children you're in a lot of pain so this was definitely the happiest <laughs> it's also a different kind of achievement you know like the other three achievements are obvious and you're doing things to better your the world and you're you're doing your purpose but this is like purely like yourself and your sense of self-worth and you going up against yourself and having to like compete with you and and like be courageous it's a different kind of victory yeah I I know what you mean I think I mean it's it's less meaningful than having children certainly or or, you know finding the right partner but the odds are so much longer, right? So it's the fact that even among the people who believe in themselves the most, and I was probably, you know, somewhere in the middle, I I probably thought the odds were better than they were. I was sort of thinking, okay, I have maybe a 25% chance of this working out, or at times maybe up to 50, but you're still sort of amazed when it, for me, I was when it actually happened. And yeah. And so what happened? She called and said, you have a publishing deal? She what had happened? two offers and one was for a two book deal for paperback for, for more money. And, and neither deal was much money at all. But um, one was more money, a two book deal for paperback. And the other one was like half the money, half of the not much money, but for hardcover. And I remember calling my mother and I knew what she was going to say, but she said, oh, you've got to do the hard, you know, the hard cover it was the whole librarian and her coming out. And, you know, I did, ag- uh, I, I did yeah. agree with her. I wanted, you know, the, I would have been thrilled with, with anything, but the, the, something about like the hard cover deal was felt just even more real, like a library book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like so, it. yeah. So I went with that one. That was with um, St. Martin's Press. And my editor was Jennifer Enderlin. And, you know, I'm no longer with that first agent. I feel like, you know, J-Lo or something saying I have a new agent and a new publisher now. But um, I was with them both for, well, my agent for four books and my editor for six books. And, you know, for professional reasons, we, we sort of parted ways along the way. But I'm still very um, good friends with my former editor with Jennifer Enderlin and she's, she's amazing. You know, it had nothing to do with her at all. She was awesome as, as, as fabulous as my new, new editor now, Jennifer Hershey with Random House. But you know, those relationships I think are so important and so sweet and so much part of the, the journey. The journey. Yeah. Well, clearly it was a successful chapter, you know? So I know that most people, well, in my world, most people know you and know your books, but just for the purpose of inspiring people, tell us what happened. So the book comes okay. out. So, um, 
And we know, we know amazing well, things happen, I mean, but not, can you take us know, that journey? So the amazing thing was right getting it published. That's what I really felt. There were surprises along the way, but it, it really did happen you know, gradually. So it was a two-book deal, and I'd only written the first one, and it was at that point, it had a different title and no cover, and they gave me a publishing date, which was um, June of 2004. So this was still a whole like, year and a half away um, because it mm-hmm. was Thanksgiving 2002. So it was still, uh-huh. it felt sort of far away. And then, of course, I had to, it was the two book deal. And that should have thrilled me because what I wanted was to write books, not just write a book and return to being a lawyer. So on the one hand, it really did thrill me. Like they, they like this enough that I get to be, continue to be a writer and, you know, get a small advance, but enough to continue to live and write. Uh, Well, not even that much, but just, you know, definitely like it was helpful towards the goal. I could work fewer hours doing my other job. But the other part of it, honestly, was fear because, you know, I think sometimes when you're pursuing a particular goal, you don't think beyond that goal. So here it was, this book was going to be published, but they're asking me to write another book. And I wasn't convinced I certainly wasn't going to say no, it's just one book and, you know, let's make it a one book deal. But at the same time, I was very, very scared at that point that I couldn't do it again. And that they, yeah, of course, I've heard this from other people who, you know, achieve some sort of like measurable, like commercial success or, or any sort of success that the rest of the world sees as success where they feel like they're a fraud. And I definitely I continue to feel that way. I mean, there's so, so every time I start a new book, I think, gosh, I've, I've fooled the publishing world and my readers into thinking that I'm actually can do this, yeah. but I really felt it at the it's time. It's like that imposter yes, syndrome. Yes. Like is that what, what they, they call think? it? They don't really know. Yeah. My husband is a big Seinfeld fan and I'm sure you know this because it's so out there, but every season, apparently Larry David would say, I can't write another season. Like, you I'm know what? I did not it. know that, but that's very reassuring to hear. Is there? And he's so good at it. And they, and they kept ordering more episodes and he would say, I, I he would have so much fear yes. and anxiety. Like I can't do it again. Yes, I can't, you know, that's, and that's clearly me. That's like, me. yeah, yeah, for right. sure. So, so that, and, and especially, I think, I think that was the very hardest because this is the first time I'm writing a book knowing that it's going to be published. Like whatever that number was, whether it was 25%, 30%, and it varied d- d- along that first year of that mm-hmm. self-imposed, you know, quiet deadline when I'm writing a story that no one right. else knows about except for the few people that I let read it. <laughs> this was different. Right. So this was hard. And, you know, when I've, when I've talked to writers before and, you know, book signings about reading um, Stephen King's memoir, I'm sure a lot of writers have read this, but the called on writing where he talks about writing with the door closed oh, yeah. versus open. And yeah. you really, I, for me, that was so important to get to the point of writing with the door closed. Like, you know, you're writing the story. It's no different than the first one, just because you know that there's a deadline and that you know who your editor is and you know who you're, you're starting to think about who your audience is based on these marketing decisions that were being made. You're still right. just doing the same thing you did the first time. So close the door and write your book. And so yeah. that's you know what I had to do along, along the way, like start that book even before the first one came out, which was, was tough, right. which was an interesting time. That is tough. That makes a lot of sense why that would be hard. So something, so something borrowed to it. And then, then that was the whole other thing. She said, I'm sure you have lots of other ideas. You know, she's like, says this oh, in right. a very encouraging way. And she's such a right. upbeat person and her enthusiasm. She's so infectious with it. And, oh, I'm sure you have lots of other ideas. And I just straight up lied to her on the phone from London, from my flat in London and said, oh, yeah, I have so many ideas. I'm just you know, I'm going to have to just think about them and I'll write some out and I'll send you some ideas and we'll figure out the next book. And I was, I had nothing. So, um, I said, can I get back to you? Can I think about them? Sure, sure, sure. You know, you have some time and just think about it and get back to me. And, and meanwhile, here are my revisions for, for something borrowed. She did have changes. And as I was making them, one of the things that I was trying to do, particularly when I heard that the book was going to have this like chick lit feel to the title and a pink cover and the ring on the front. I, I don't know if I knew about the sparkly diamond ring at that point, but I definitely knew it was being marketed <laughs> as this chick lit. I was very mindful of wanting to make sure that the characters weren't coming across as just complete, you know, just prototypes, like exaggerated. 
And right. really now looking back, I wish I had toned toned Darcy down even more, but I definitely in my revisions toned her down, tried to show you know, maybe why it is that she was the way she was, like what she had insecurities. Yeah. She felt like she wasn't as ever smart as as her friend. I mean, you hear this from these really beautiful women who have these insecurities. Mm-hmm. I don't know about that. I kind of have my doubts that Giselle's walking around with any great insecurity, but <laughs> that's what I hear. And so I, I revised that character with some of those ideas in mind. And as I was making those revisions um, to the to the story, I became more interested in and her as a character and trying to see her side of the story and writing more sympathetic scenes to her. Ultimately, by the time I wrote the sequel, which of course was something blue and I told this, you know, story from Darcy's point of view, I think I was able to find some, some redeeming things to her and she changed and, yeah. you know, hopefully as you say, I created some empathy for her, but that mm-hmm. I did along with the reader because when I sat down to write that, that was part of my block. One of it was the fear of, people are actually going to read this and I have a real deadline. But the other one was, I don't like this girl. And now I've signed up to write this sequel, which my Hmm. editor loved the idea when I presented it to her, which I sort of presented so tentatively. I'm like, I don't know how you feel about this, but yeah, it might be really cheesy. And, you know, it's not like I want to write a whole series and, you know, you'd probably have to call it something blue and that sounds really cheesy. But do you, what would you think if I wrote a sequel from this perspective of the other friend because you know there's always two sides to stories to to these friendship tales we all in our lives women girls you know more so than men I would say but have these like very intense friendships that sometimes fall out or sometimes don't work out or you grow apart and Mm -hmm. I think the accounts of that that splintering is always very different yeah of course even when there's something black and white involved like you know the, the taboo mm-hmm. of having an affair with your best friend's fiance. That's pretty clear cut, but even I, I think I was able to create those, those nuances there. So that's how I came to write the sequel. Yeah. And the books, I know that something, something borrowed is in how many languages? I think, 30 languages? Yeah, 30, 33 or something. I don't know if I could even name the languages that they're in, but. And are they all, were they all number one bestsellers? No, 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 they weren't all. So I think my first, there were three of them, I think right? only two. So what happened was, um, so something borrowed never, I think it got what it was like high as it was on the extended list, maybe, or maybe it was at 12. And then I know baby proof got right. up a little higher to sit, like something blue came up high. They all sort of got higher than the one before them, but they ended up all being number. So I had three or four books in a row that were number two that never got it to number one, but were number two. And even then, when yeah. something borrowed came back out, came out on a movie, you know, sometimes that'll pop back up onto number one. But even yeah. that one ended up yeah. being number two because it was the same time that The Help came out. I know. Let me let me try oh, to yeah. remember well. who I was number two <laughs> to. It was definitely Twilight was one. James Patterson was another. The Help was another. Um, Gone Girl was another. And then I remember my husband saying, oh, you're like the Buffalo Bills of writers because the Buffalo Bills had lost five Super Bowls. And um, uh-huh. I said that to a reporter. I'm like, oh, yeah, my husband calls me the Buffalo Bills of Writers. And then they printed it. <laughs> and then it went into the little, you know, the little blurb in the New York Times, like the Buffalo Bills of Writers. That's funny. Okay. But then That's I, funny. so I think the, the, well, I know the first one that was number one was the one and only. So I've, I've only had two number one bestsellers, which is probably two more than I deserve. But um, it's. Uh, no, Emily. Yeah. So something uh, borrowed never, never hit number one. What was it like for you to see it in the You know, it, again, it happens so gradually. It's like your sort of disbelief along the way. Like, so the book was optioned early on and then that lapsed and then it was optioned again and that started to lapse. Like it was coming up to the deadline and then another a producer was interested in it and she was here in Atlanta. By then I had moved to Atlanta from London and I, um, she called me and she said, did, you know, could we go to dinner? And she was filming, her name's Molly Smith and she's a you know, successful producer now at the time. I think she was an associate producer, but she was working on the blind side and she, um, mm-hmm. asked to meet wow. with me. She was filming in Atlanta and we really hit it off. And she said she wanted to buy the option from whoever it was who had it. And so that happened. But again, uh-huh she's the third producer who's bought it and it's been over the course of years and they've lapsed multiple times. So although I was excited and it was the first time I had met with someone face to face, so it felt a little more 
hopeful. I really didn't think it was going to happen. Things are optioned all the time. And in fact, several of our other of my books have been optioned and nothing's happened with them. So I really didn't think that Not much yet. of it. Yeah. But then it, you know, she ultimately, of course, you know, learned about the process along the way, but they found a director and they got the talent attached and it, then it was greenlit. And so that it's all sort of like, oh, this is real. This is real. This is real. And then by the time it happened, um, it was, it was definitely thrilling and surreal and, you know, wonderful to see it. Were you on the set? I was set? on the set. I got Were a little cameo. I'm reading a copy. I'm reading something blue on a, on a bench in a, one of the park scenes. Oh. So that, oh, that was my idea. That was my, so that was my brilliant idea to like be reading the next book. So <laughs> there was a lot of fun. There was a few things I disagreed with them about and would argue my case, but, and say, oh no, I really don't want Ethan and Rachel to like each other. I want the integrity of that male female friendship. And I don't want there to be an under, undercurrent of, of feelings there. But I understood too, that movies are different than books. And for the movie, they, they felt that they needed that tension in the third act. And that was all very interesting right. to me. And I was able to step back from it and yeah. say, okay, the book's the book. It's your movie. You know, I'm, I'm happy to weigh in and I'm, I'll disagree with things, but it's ultimately your project. Yeah. And because I was able to keep that perspective, I think they enjoyed working with me and they would have just cut me out if I had been, you know, stamping my foot on the side because ultimately you don't get a say. But you just told, you know, over the course of this interview, you've told two stories about times where you stuck to your guns and other times where you made space, you know, for somebody else's idea. And that's, I think both of those things are important and not everybody has balance, you know, doing them both, but I think you need to be successful. There are times well, where you're you, good. Cause you I know, didn't even notice that. That's a good little takeaway. You should be a, you should be a therapist, but yeah, I think there's something really fun about the collaborative world of filmmaking and TV. Not that I have much experience with it, but just that project is such a, you know, you're, it's very solitary writing, writing books, um, until you get to the point where you're working with your editor. But, um, it was a lot of fun working on that script. Can you believe at this point that you've written eight books and nine books? No. I mean, it's amazing. In some ways I can't only because too, it's just, it's coincided with having three children. And I'm like, this has been, this has been a busy decade, but, um, but yes, wow. yes, I'm excited so, about this one coming out in paperback for sure. So tell us just quickly, why do you love this book and why should people go and read it? I'm sure oh. they're going to want to read it just because you're the nicest person <laughs> oh, I've ever talked so... to. Um, and the other books are amazing. But tell me why else they might want to read this book. What's this book so, about? Why'd First you Comes Love book? is about um, sisters. It's it, primarily about the sister bond. And it's the first book that I wrote with that as the primary focus. And there's other relationships in it. They're both, you know, one's in a marriage and the other sister wants to have a baby and she isn't with anyone. And she's sort of like that biological clock issue and thinking about that. But at heart, the book is about the sister bond and you know, I have a sister and she's, you know, my only sibling, one year older and such a critical, important relationship to me. And it's, it's it's interesting that it's taken me this long to really explore that relationship. But, um, I loved writing about Josie and Meredith and their respective lives. They're, they're facing the 15 year anniversary of their brother, Daniel's death. And so the book is also about grief and how we move on from grief and how differently we can react to grief even in in one family when you expect your reaction to things to be you know similar to your yeah. siblings but the two sisters are both facing that benchmark and in so doing they take a look at their lives and what's happening in their life and they examine their relationships and their relationship with each other um, as they approach this benchmark. Wow. So it's definitely a family saga mm-hmm. story. It's about grief. It's about sisters. It's about making our lives what we want it to be, even though it's often not and that life's not a fairy tale and we have to um, sometimes yeah. you know, make choices and take control of our lives, which is definitely something we've talked about in this in this conversation, yeah, you know, that true. the decision to move to London and write the book has really colored, I think, a lot of my stories and characters. And it definitely does in this. And that, you know, Meredith, the older sister, is in a marriage that she's just questioning and she's not sure about. And that's her journey. And the other sister is just desperate to be married and wants to have a child. 
and asks herself the question, like, do I want to try to do this alone? And I think that's a really mm. incredibly brave choice that, that some women make. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to write about that. So well, I've got to shorten amazing. that answer, I, don't I? I? <laughs> no, I love that answer. Those topics, you know, I think are so relevant right now. I, I know personally, I know three women who've had babies on their own and, I think that that's Isn't important. That brave? That I mean, that's more... brave. Like leaving yeah, your job is. you really hate brave. in New York City and going to yeah. write a book is not brave. Having a baby alone is just amazing. But you know, whether you call it chiclet or women's fiction or anything else, I think that what I try to write about is just, you know real people, characters who seem very real, yeah. and and their relationships. And I think relationships are what really ultimately, you know, we've talked mostly in this in this conversation about you know, what I do for a living and writing and so forth. But if you think about your life and the fact that you're doing this amazing podcast and thing and you have a book deal coming up, but really when you strip it all away, like you are the same person, whether or not any of those things happened and, oh, yeah. and you're yeah. your daughter's mother. And I think that's one thing in my books that, yes, it's about finding fulfillment and following your passions and, and making those decisions, but ultimately your lives are some of your relationships. And so as long as I have relationships so to write true. about, I, so I'll true. have um, all the material I need, whether it's whether it's called chiclet or anything else. And that's how people are remembered, too. If you think about, you know, even the most that's successful true. people, if you go to their funerals, you know, it's you're not hearing about what they accomplished as, as nearly as much as their, you know, their relationships. And so... I think oh, that's the real, that's so nice. really interesting part of life. And if you and if you mess those up, what is it? Jackie Kennedy said, "If you bungle raising your children, nothing else matters." But if it, it's really true, I yeah. mean, it sounds like such a cliche, but it's true that that's really the definition of like who we are. Well, how have you done this? How do you balance writing eight books and being a mom of three kids? How the have same you way that? you're doing this. <laughs> podcast right now I mean right barely surviving oh it's just hard I mean I think you said something very early on in the conversation that is so true you just you you have to accept the fact that you're going to make compromises it's not going to be perfect you're you're going to always feel inadequate as a you you could be doing more as a writer you could be doing more as a mother you could be doing more you could be doing you just do you know the best you can and it's a balance and you just finding that balance and I think whether or not you're a working mother, you're a stay-at-home mother, you're a part-time mother, you're you know father in any of those different categories, you're never going to be able to have it all. I mean, I, I even hate that expression because it suggests that if you you work and you have a family, you have it all. Well, that's not true. Yeah. I mean, when I'm gone for six weeks over on a particular summer on a book tour, when my hardcovers come out, like I'm I'm gone. I miss all these things with my kids and my husband's doing it with them. So that's certainly not having it all. And if someone's, you know, a stay at home mother, then they might miss this experience. And if you don't have children, you might miss an experience. And if you do have children, let's frankly think about how much more we could be doing professionally (laughs) if we didn't have children or just personally, like the adventure you could be having. The bond we could have with our spouses if we didn't have children getting in the way. (laughs) So it's very different. So So there's no, there's no such Um, thing. So, I feel like it's so hard not to oh, love you. When you, you you're, to you're just no. You, can we be friends? You're so. I'm seriously like I love you. I'm like you're so warm and so kind and so self aware and so grounded. Um, okay, so my last question is: if somebody's listening to this, which they are, and they're listening and they're like so impressed with you, and they have a dream, like you've already said so many great things, but maybe what's one of the best pieces of advice that you've ever gotten? Or, or a good piece of advice that you'd want to give to someone pursuing their dream. You know, I think sometimes we think that all of our, all of our answers, all of our like goals, like end in a certain like accomplishing something. And sometimes it really is the journey that I think is more important. Yeah. You know, I I believe that if I had you know quit my job as a lawyer, given myself this self imposed deadline, moved to London, written this book, and ultimately it wasn't published. And let's just say. Not only was it not published, but the third one or the fourth one that I had written it wasn't published. I think that you would have a different story to tell. You know, you would have a different, yeah. something good would come out of that. It, it really is the journey. 
And, you know, I would have still moved to, to London and I would have, you know, married my husband right. and had my children and so many, yeah. you know, maybe I would have had a different career. I mean, sometimes I sit there and, and, and when you reach a dream, it just doesn't all get perfect. Like, oh, you, you've accomplished this, yeah. this goal. And so, so everything's true. perfect. No, I have days where yeah. I despise yeah. having these deadlines and I'm scared and I'm feeling the pressure and I wish I could just have like a more lighthearted, easy life where I don't have to like write this next, right. you know, bestseller. And what if it isn't a bestseller and then I'm going right. to feel like a failure. So I think that to constantly redefine your goals and your, your dreams and be open to new experiences and to see failures as opportunities instead of failures, yeah. I think is important. It's so important because people attach their happiness to these outcomes and then it doesn't come. But if you attach your happiness to your growth and the day-to-day journey, then you're always going to feel like you're you're growing and, and growth is, is oxygen. And that's going to ultimately be the thing that makes you the most happy is, is being able to show up for your life and, and keep going yes. and, and make and the that's best my answer. What I, you just said. <laughs> no, what you said, I got that. No, I, lo- no, I love um, that. I loved what you just said. So you I love better that. include it in this interview because I want, okay, well, I want every, be, yes, so I want everyone sweet. to hear what you just said. But anyway, it was really nice talking to you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for picking me. Emily, I love sitting here and talking to you. I feel like you're a friend that I've known for so long. Thank you for being so down to earth and warm and awesome. Here are some of the takeaways. There's so many. Number one, don't just be successful for the sake of success. Think of what's really going to fulfill you. Number two, misery can actually be great because it's very motivating. It's better to be miserable than comfortable. Number three, people magnify the risks in your mind that you're going to fail, but you've got to take those risks. Number four, look for excitement. If you find that somebody's really enthusiastic about what you're doing, that's a good person to work with. Number five, your lives are actually a sum of your relationships. So we need to make sure that that's where we put some of our attention. Number six, accept the fact that it won't be perfect. Just do the best you can. Number seven, there is no such thing as having it all. So we have to just accept that and make the most of what we have. Number eight, the most important thing is the journey. Just because you reach a dream doesn't mean it's perfect. Number nine, be open to new experience. And number 10, failure is actually an opportunity to grow. Thank you guys for listening to our show. Please tell your friends about it. Please keep helping to support this show. We love you. You've helped us more than you could ever know. Your support actually creates a whole world of difference for us. Your reviews have helped this show grow, have helped other people find us. We've, it, it's unbelievable that we are high on the charts on iTunes because of you. So please leave us an iTunes review. It helps us so much. Please, please leave us an iTunes review. Tell your friends about the show and go grab the free cheat sheet. Go to nodayjobs.com. We'll talk to you next week. I want to give a shout out to the amazing team who makes this show possible. Special thanks to our executive producer, Tim Street, and producer, Emma Kikuchi. The podcast is a production of Authentic. For more info on advertising in this show, visit AuthenticShows.com.